She's the Cuban-American psychotherapist from Los Angeles who has sold more books than Stig Larsson and Dan Brown in Norway. And now she's here. Her magic fairy tales make us want to fly, follow our dreams, and discover the secrets of life. I'm so happy you came all this way. Please welcome Cecilia Samartin. Sofa. <laughs> You're the one who's lying on the sofa. I know, today. this is a very reverse situation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> You're from Cuba. You live in Los Angeles mm -hmm. or outside Los Angeles. But on your webpage, you describe yourself as Norway's best selling author. There must be a thing about you in Scandinavia. Well, have you, what's the explanation? Well, I've certainly had plenty of time to reflect on, on the great relationship that I have been developing with Scandinavian readers. And, you know, I, I don't know that I've come up with a particular answer necessarily. I think I leave it to the, the, the wonder and the mystery of publishing and what happens when you... Uh, develop a contact and a relationship with your readers. Mm. And, um, and I think I have. I, I, I just embrace the mystery. I feel a synergy and a closeness with, with Scandinavians. I, I, I know there is this stereotype, which I personally uh, haven't found to be true, which is that, that Scandinavian people are very reserved and, and sort of um, guarded. Uh, I haven't found that, to be honest with you. I think that... Um, I have found Scandinavian people to be very warm and loving and open and searching. And uh, I think those, uh, that kind of attitude is a, a very good connection with what I write about. Mm -hmm. so. And so are I'm you happy. warm and, and open. You. I had the opportunity to visit Cecilia uh, in your beautiful home outside Los Angeles. And uh, there's an interview in the latest issue of Books and Dreams, which you also can, can read later. Your first book, uh, Dream Heart, Drömhjärta in Swedish, mm -hmm. it was actually the third book coming out in Swedish, but f for you it was the first book. Yes. Can you describe that feeling? You had worked as a psychotherapist for a long time, that was your main job, mm -hmm. and then suddenly you had this big hit with, a, with your first book. Yes. Well, it was uh, a... I was stunned. I was surprised. I didn't expect that kind of success, and certainly not so far from home. But it was particularly gratifying for me, because Dromherta is a story about my homeland, uh, uh, Cuba, that I haven't been able to go back to for various reasons. Mm. And it was so, so close and so intimate, and it was drawn from many experiences that I had been listening to, real stories that my family had experienced and had re suffered with. So to have people connect with that and understand was, uh, well, it's, it's probably one of the most gratifying experiences, not just for me, but for my whole family. Mm. So it, it, we're still experiencing loving that and experiencing the wonder. It's a beautiful story about friendship and two cousins, Nora and Alice, from, from Cuba. You were born in Havana, 1961, and your parents escaped and came as refugees to California after the Cuban Revolution, when you were just a baby, right? Right, yes. Uh, could you describe Cuba then and, and now? Well, it's been uh, now, I think, 52, going on 53 years um, to the revolution, uh, since the revolution. And Cuba before was uh, not a perfect society. There's nobody who would, everybody would agree with me, especially Cubans who'd lived there. But it was uh, nevertheless prosperous. It was at that time the, uh, one of the most, if not the most prosperous country in all of Latin America. I came from a very standard middle class family. There was a thriving middle class in Cuba at the time, free enterprise, and um, it, it was a, a, a very nice place to live for most people. Mm. It needed change, 
and it needed, uh, I think, an evolution in an evolution rather than a, a revolution mm -hmm. in, in society and particularly in government because there was a, a corrupt dictator at the time. But now, 50 years later, Cuba has become uh, the poorest nation in the, uh, the Latin American countries and uh, it has become a third world country. Mm -hmm. So it's sad, very sad for uh, Cuban refugees and most especially for Cubans living on the island to quite literally watch their country crumble down mm -hmm. and uh, dissolve before their very eyes. You have a dream to go back there, but it's impossible? It's impossible for me to go because I have been outspoken about my support for human rights on the island and in particular for those very courageous men and women who have sacrificed themselves to speak out mm. um, on behalf of Cuban rights. Mm. And for that reason, I'm not very much liked by the government and probably wouldn't be mm. allowed to go. And this is true for any journalist or writer or public person who mm. makes a statement, especially Cubans themselves who make statements about their hope for change and betterment in the country. They so. have called you a CIA spy? Yes, I've been called right? a CIA spy. Yeah, it's. But I didn't know I had that job as well, and it's, it's kind of funny. I, I consider it a a badge of honor to have um, mm. bothered them that much that they would do that. So. Your new book uh, coming out in uh, in Sweden in, in in Sweden now. It's uh, La, Pere, La Peregrina. Yes, I'm not so good in Spanish. That's yes, perfect. <laughs> perfect. And it's the second book in this Pilgrim trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, a sequel to Senor Peregrino. Yes. Mm -hmm. What uh, you have walked this uh, El Camino, yes. uh, the pilgrimage in uh, in Spain, Santiago de Compostela, mm -hmm. right? Perfect. And something happened there. Uh, it was after Drömjärta, after mm -hmm. dream, uh, dream Heart. Yes. Tell me about that moment. Well. It was the the entire experience of the walk was such a, a mystical and and wonderful experience. I I started out walking it as a kind of a research mm. because I had been writing Senor Peregrino and it deals with the pilgrimage. I'm just going to ask, how many know till the här vandringsleden i i Spanien? So you know where we are. Bra, all all are with. I must just call. Sorry, I just wanted to to check everybody. No. Uh, heard yeah. about the Camino de yeah. Santiago. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. And, and, and Has anybody walked it? Not yet. Yeah. I saw a hand. Yes. I th yeah, maybe hand. there have been a mm -hmm. few people. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how mm -hmm. I've met many people just in these last two or three days who've said they've walked the Camino. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and you haven't walked the whole. Oh but no. no. I, I wish one day. That is one of my dreams. I, you you really need a good amount of time, at least three months, mm -hmm. to to walk it. Maybe more, depending on weather and. And what happened when you when you walked so, the first well, time? When I was walking, this is when I really had an epiphany that uh, the characters came to life for me, uh, for the story. And I was I was listening to their voices, and it was a time when I made uh, a, a real commitment that I was going to take the writing thing seriously. And I realized it was my path; it was what I was meant to do, and. Uh, it, for me, it, it changed my life. Mm. So I started out with a kind of a mind of doing some research and having some fun, and it turned into something much, much more profound mm. and life-changing. Mm. It, it, it can transform a person, I think. Mm. You have tra transformed your husband too. You're going to work together. We are. My mm. husband. Well, first of all, to convince my husband, my husband's idea of a vacation is on a beautiful beach with palms and people bringing you drinks and having a great time. Mm -hmm. So when I said, how about we do a vacation where we walk with backpacks 20, 30 miles a day and we do it for 10 days? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> and he indulged me and we did it. And uh, he was transformed himself. And he, he has become a very spiritual person since that. And this year he is going to turn 50 years old. And I said, what would you like to do? We can go anywhere. We can go to the most wonderful beach if you like, whatever you say. He says, no, I want to walk the Camino again. That's what I'm going to do for my 50th. So, wow. uh, I, that's, that's in a few weeks, right? We're going to go in about three weeks. Mm. Wow. Yes. Uh, tell me about La Peregrina and your uh, characters. It's about... Uh, 
Jamilet, did you yes. say Jamilet? Jamilet, perfect, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Jamilet is a, the, the first book uh, moves into the second, so briefly I'll say Jamilet is a young woman who is born with a disfiguring birthmark on her back, and it brings her great suffering because, first of all, people judge her for that. Um, she lives in a small village in Mexico, and and people believe that this mark is a sign of the devil. And there's a lot of superstition in, in villages in Latin America and Mexico still. And so she decides she's going to leave this village and go north to get rid of it, to find modern medical intervention that will help her. Uh, and instead of finding that particular remedy, she meets a very disagreeable man who work, who is a patient in a mental hospital, and she is assigned, she needs a job so she can earn the money to see a, a doctor to get rid of this uh, situation, and so she is assigned to look after this very disagreeable man, and uh, at first she finds him uh, just despicable, and nobody can work with him, nobody can attend to him, but over time, they develop a friendship and a relationship, and he starts to tell her the reason that he's there, and his story is about a walk that he did on the Camino, the Santiago, and a woman that he fell in love with who was certainly phenomenally beautiful and alluring, but also very mysterious. And she had a power over everybody that she met. There was an aura about her uh, that went far and beyond just her beauty. But throughout the book of Señor Peregrino, we never really learn who she is. She remains a very mysterious character. La Peregrina is a story that focuses on who she was and what her story was and where she really was able to gain this power and this wisdom, really, that she had. Uh, and, and so it's her story. And it's also connected to Jamalet's story because Jamalet, in the first book, is anxious to get rid of this horrible mark that she has. But in the second book, she's realizing that, wait a minute, this mark means something. Mm. It's connected to something in my past. It, it, uh, it, it's connected to perhaps my purpose in, in life, and it, uh, she, she wants to find out about it. So it's a search, mm. a search for... Well, you prefer to call yourself a storyteller rather than, than an author. Why yes. is that? I, I, for me, in my definition, there is a distinction. Uh, I, I think that story, both writers and storytellers are very concerned with the words, of course, and the work, and getting that right. And they're also very concerned, or at least they should be, with the readers, and the way that the readers are going to react to and collaborate with the book, because it is a collaboration, right? I believe that the, that, a, that a writer is perhaps puts more emphasis on the words and the work, and that the storyteller puts more emphasis on the reader. Mm. It's really about the reader mm. and what is this going to, how is this story going to impact the reader? What is this story going to mean for them and their lives and their stories? And so, I guess that's the therapist in me, you know. It, 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 Uh, my goal as a writer is not very different from my goal as a therapist, and I, I hope that my stories are are encouraging, that they uh, in, invite people to reflect on their lives and their relationships, and, and, and how... Tell our own stories. And tell your own mm-hmm. stories, absolutely. When you grew up in Los Angeles, your family mantra was work hard and for God's sake be careful. Absolutely. Were you? Be careful. Uh, well, not as careful, perhaps, as my parents would have liked. I was the oldest of three, and I was came from a very traditional family. But, I, I, you know, I, I was careful, and I understood the reason, because of all of the fear that they had lived in, in Cuba, not wanting to get noticed. You didn't want to get noticed in Cuba, because if you were noticed, you could go to jail, or, or worse, or better, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so I think for many years I have been trying to be less careful. And one of the ways that I've been less careful is to become a writer. Mm-hmm. You know, it isn't mm-hmm. the most secure and um, easy career. 
And you work hard. I work up hard. Very absolutely. Very early in the morning. I work up. I wake up very early in the morning. I'm an early writer. I'm a morning writer, and I had to be at the beginnings, especially when I was working two jobs at the same time. So um, it's your, worked. Your books are quite spiritual and epic novels, you, you could say. And could you tell me what's what's your spiritual view of of the world? What what do you believe in? Well, I believe that there is a loving creator who watches over each of us regardless of our faith and our background and um, what particular beliefs we ha we have. I believe that we all have a divine spark mm -hmm. within us. And part of uh, our purpose is connecting to that and listening to that voice. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a magical, divine voice. And, and miracles happen when we listen to that mm -hmm. voice and when we connect to each other on that level. I think it's, it's the core of who we are. I think it is immutable. And I think it is eternal. You have a dream to uh, bring your parents back to, back to Cuba? Yes. Do you think it will be possible? I'm ho holding on to that dream. My father is uh, 84, but I, he's a very young 84 and a very vibrant 84. My mother is a few years younger, and we still hope that one day we will go to a free Cuba. Mm -hmm. To a free Cuba. That would be my greatest dream. I hope you have a wonderful 50th birthday with your husband thank and you. walk safe. Thank in you life. very and much. And thank you so much thank for you. coming all the thank way you. to Sweden. Thank, thank you, Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you.